All right. So we're still, um, we're going to lesson four. So we're, tonight we're going to be talking about Exodus 1 through 19. Now I kind of did, hey, you're giggling now. Just wait till next week. You know, you want to talk about, you know, drinking from a fire hydrant. But um, so I actually this week don't have as many slides and scripture references, and that's my fault. So um, it, tonight, today would be a good day to have your Bible open and just kind of follow through it because I'm going to be hitting a lot of different stuff. Um, so anyway, I want to start off, though, um, with Exodus 34, even though that's not in this section. Um, I think that, you know, John Mark just really paved the way for a lot of this um, just discussion. It's really beautiful seeing biblical counseling being taught and then the Word of God being taught, you know, um, in, in order and just seeing how, you know, just how wonderful God's Word is and how much these topics go together. Um, I want to start off with just reading Exodus um, 34, 4 through 7. And I want to just remind us why we're doing this study and again, why we need the Bible. Why we need the Bible as missionaries, as pastors, as biblical counselors, as Christians. Right? Why we need the Bible, why we even come here and waste our time talking about it. You know, we're not wasting our time, you know. But why we would come here, we would be wasting our time, you know, if the scriptures were, were, were not involved. But why we need the Bible, you know, and again, this applies personally in your own devotional life, in your family life, and in your ministry, or whatever. Um, let's read together Mo Exodus 34, 4 through 7. Oh, excuse me, maybe 5 through 7. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So this is the scene where Moses is um, before God on, on the mountain and is interceding for, for Israel because they had broken covenant with God right when the covenant was being established. He couldn't even get down the, the mountain before they had broken the covenant. Um, and God's like, okay, Moses, I'm going to just continue on my promises through you. I'm going to destroy them. I continue on the seed and the promises made to Abraham through you. And Moses pleads with God and says, what will the Egyptians think? For your namesake, Lord, do this. And will you please show me your glory? Right? So he's so bold to pray that to God. Had anybody at that point prayed anything like that in Scripture? No. But yet what you find in Exodus, the book of Exodus, a lot of scholars will say the book of Exodus is a book about God. I mean, the Bible is a book about God. But what's really wonderful about Exodus is we see a lot about God revealed um, in Genesis. And it, you could say that you see more about who God is in Exodus. And one thing that's wonderful, Moses is so bold to say, show me your glory, and God does it. Of course, he does it within reason, within Moses' ability to receive it as a sinful human. Right? He puts him in the cleft of the rock and you know, passes by him and proclaims his name to him. And this is what he says to him. Okay, and then we know Moses walks down, you know, his face is glorious shining from his face, right? Um, but one thing I wanted to bring out, how does this, why do we need the Bible? Okay, one thing that is extremely interesting about this quote, um, this revelation of God that God gave Moses, is from this point on throughout the scriptures, how much um, this text is used. So the revelation that God gave Moses of who he was, Moses, of course, wrote it down. And then you have generation after generation in, throughout Israel's history using it. And you have them using it in different ways. And I think it's a great lesson from the Bible on how to use the Bible, right? So we, we've been talking so much in both of these lectures about the need for the Bible um, and how it's special revelation. We can only know so much about God without him. Um, revealing himself to us and how it is the revelation how we need illumination and not revelation um, 
because we don't wake up and just know who God is, you know, and all of that stuff. We can't work up these warm feelings and or go by what we feel or what we perceive about God. And, you know, um, we need God to instruct us. But what's, you know, we say that and, and that's right. But what's really great to even see is how the Bible affirms that and uses the Bible. Okay, and so when you go on and you, you when you take this, when you when you read the scriptures from out you know from here on out you'll see that ref- a reference of them quoting um, this verse um, and whatever their circumstances they're referring to God as God revealed Himself to Moses and they don't have it just as this theological category God is this they take it one step further by faith they then approach God on behalf of how He's revealed Himself they let what God has said not just be a theological category for them, but they let it affect their, their practice and worship of God. You know, which, which is maybe very oversimplistic, but, um, and, and just kind of like a duh, Cody, you know, but sorry, you know, for people like me, that, that means a lot to know that, you know. Um, but um, one thing I want to say, you know, how to use the Bible, we need to let God's Word affect what you believe about God and how you relate to Him based upon His character and what He has done. Um, and I just want to show, you know, again, we don't have this on, on the thing. Um, again, this is just by way of showing, you know, why are we even doing what we're doing. You know, Psalms 86, 4-7, through seven, this text is quoted, and it's on a personal level. He's not talking about Israel as a whole. He's not like Moses. He's trying to lead the people of Israel. He's got some personal stuff going on. Right? It's, he's in trouble. He knows his sins before him. Listen to what he says. Gladden the soul. This is Psalms 86, 4-7. through Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Right? You know, it's important to note that he's not, yes, this is, this is the authoritative Word of God, the inspired Word of God, but God did not speak to him at this point and say, like he did to Moses, to say, Lord, Lord, I'm slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. No, he's basing, quoting Exodus. Right? And what he is doing, he is in a time of need and a time of trouble. And he's quoting scripture and he's saying, because this is who God is, I'm going to come to him for grace in my time of trouble. And I'm going to come confidently. Right? So this is a difference between, again, how does the Bible use the Bible? How do Christians in the Bible use the Bible? He didn't just have this category of the attributes of God here. You know, I have my categories here, right? My my crystal clean, crystal clear, you know, wonderful theology here. He's in a mess. He knows he's in sin. He's, he's repenting of his sin. And he's letting who God is be the basis by which he comes to God in prayer, confident, needing grace in the day of trouble. So it's taking, how do we use the Bible? That's how we apply it. We need good theology, but we need to let it affect how we view God. And that's huge. I mean, think about, I mean, you know, one of the things that John Owen says, very, very helpful, is that one of the devil's things is he tries to, 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 you know, he tries to, with God's true children, those who have been born again in Christ, one of his things that he does is he tries to change the way and affect the way that God's people view God. And they try to, he tries to give them thoughts of hard thoughts of God towards them is what he would say. They, he tries to get them to view the God as thinking harshly of them. Right? You know, John Mark quoted Martin Lloyd-Jones earlier. He has a famous saying, a commentary on Psalms 42 saying, you ever notice that we walk, wake up and we're just talking to ourselves? Or, or we're listening to ourselves? You know, we, we don't know. We don't even know we're doing it, but we're just listening to it. Right? Especially when we're in things such as trials such as depression and anxiety. He's like, and what we really should be doing is talking to ourselves. 
and telling ourselves what is true, right? Because we don't, if you, if you wake up and in one morning you're going to go by how you feel, right? Or how you perceive in your own, whatever you want to call it, feelings towards God. Can you really trust that? No. Right? And our, is, is that how we're supposed to operate? No. We need to let the Word of God instruct how we perceive God and even God's perception of us. Right? Okay? Another example. This is more on a corporate level. In Joel um, 2, chapter 2, verse 14. So Joel is prophesying. This is a time where Israel is in sin. They've been breaking the covenant. Right? And Joel sit there and he's, he's prophesying to the people of Israel. And he's preaching judgment. There will be famine. There will be destruction. Yada, yada, yada. And, okay? So he's saying, Joel 2, um, 12 through 14, he says, here's what Joel's saying to them that declares the Lord. This is the thus says the Lord. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return. Okay? End of quote. Thus says the Lord. Now here is Joel saying to them, Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And He relents over disaster. Who knows whether He will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and drink offering for the Lord your God. He's preaching destruction and judgment and repentance on the people. And He says, Repent. You need to repent. And hey, Perhaps God will not only relent the disaster He's promised, but will even leave a blessing in the path. Again, this is taking who God has revealed Himself to be and letting it drive your experience and your relation, really forming your relationship with God. So you see the people of Israel doing that. Joel saying, guys, we need to repent. And here's some more motivation. Look who God is. He is merciful and gracious. I, you know, he's, he's promising judgment. Who knows? If we repent, maybe he'll leave us, maybe we'll return even being blessed because that's who he is. This is how, I mean, the, the, the um, examples are so numerous that we could really spend all night talking about just this verse in particular. So we need to let God's word affect what you believe about God and how you relate to him based upon his character and what he has done. So an example don't just have this, okay, you read the Bible and you see, yeah, God is Father. And you have this theological category, God is Father through His people. Okay, don't let it stop there. You get on your knees and before you open your mouth in prayer, you stop and you think about God being your Father and all the blessings that that entails before you pray. This is applying it. Right? This is how, you know, you want to know the love of God for you more and more and more. What is it going to take for you to know God loves you? Go to where He has revealed it. See His promises. See His character. See His works. And you'll see that God loves you. Then it's up to you and whether or not you're going to actually believe it or not. Then it comes down to faith. Right? So we need to constantly let our God's Word dictate what is truth over your feelings, over your circumstances. You know, I don't know, can't tell you how many times I've went to pray and just felt, I don't know, the, kind of those harsh thoughts. And it's like, are those true? When Psalms, 30, when Psalms 103 says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. You know, so it really takes faith in the word of God and letting the word mold every aspect of your Christian experience. And that's how the word uses the word. Okay, um, so that's just a little bit by way of introduction. Um, let's just kind of get into, I want to start off with, the, again, we're getting to some of these bigger narratives, and so I'm just going to kind of walk through a summary, and then we'll walk through some key theological points. Okay, so remembering where we're at, that Genesis ends with Joseph's faith and the promise of Yahweh to fulfill his promises to his people. Remember, God had made many promises to Abraham. They could be summed up, as three, the promise of offspring, land, and universal blessing. By the end of Genesis, we see the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and his offspring. Israel had become God's special people, 
and they are beginning to grow in number, around 70. Still not a great nation, as God had promised, but they are growing. However, still one promise is yet to be fulfilled, the promise of land. land. The kingdom pattern in Edom was lost, which was God's people under God's rule, in God's place. And God promised through Abraham's offspring, the people of Israel, to restore the kingdom of God on earth. In Genesis 15, God had told Abraham that his offspring would be servants in another land for 400 years, and then he would bring judgment upon the nation and deliver his people with a great deliverance, and they would leave that nation with great possessions into the promised land. And Genesis ends with God's people around 70 in Egypt um, with hope and expectation of God to fulfill his promises to his people. And so that sets the stage where Exodus begins. Um, so now let's kind of walk through this chapters 1 through 19. So Exodus begins where Genesis ends. God's people are in Egypt. They started out small, but at this point, we see much multiplication in the God's promises being fulfilled. Um, it says, but the people of Israel, were ex- this is chapter 1, were exceedingly fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and were exceedingly strong so that they grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. God had been faithful. By this time, Joseph, who had saved Egypt, had been dead for a while. And there arose a Pharaoh who did not know of Joseph nor remember him. This Pharaoh became increasingly nervous about the growing population of the Israelites, so he decided to enslave the Hebrew people and treat them with great cruelty, such cruelty that he even commanded all the Hebrew boys to be killed at birth. The Jewish midwives, however, ignored this command because they feared Yahweh. The Israelites were suffering under great, great bondage. Chapter 2, a young boy from the tribe of Levi is born. His name is Moses. Out of fear of his life, his mother puts him in a basket to the Nile River. Moses is sent down the river and discovered and raised by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses grows up and one day he sees an Egyptian fighting with a Hebrew. Moses, with Indignation strikes the Egyptian man and kills him. This act gets discovered. Moses flees to another country, Midian, and gets married and lives there as a shepherd. Things begin to change. It says in chapter 2, 23 through 25, During those days the kings of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Israel may have forgotten what God had promised to Abraham. God told him that His people would be liberated in 400 years. Maybe they thought God had forgotten them. But what does the Scripture say? In those 400 years of groaning, God saw. God knew. God's timing was pretty amazing. So God always fulfills His promises, and His timing is always perfect. Chapter 3 through 5, God hears the groanings of His people, and He remembers His promise to Abraham and raises up Moses to go save His people. Moses does not feel capable, even though he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. For this He doesn't feel capable for this calling and tells God that he does not want to go. God gives him help with his brother Aaron. Chapter 6 through 12, Moses goes with with Aaron to go to Pharaoh and to tell them that God, uh, God says to him, Let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh refuses, as God said he would, and asks, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? Then the rest of the book of Exodus is God answering his question of who he is. And he does so by demonstrating ten plagues and judging Egypt and liberating his people, with the last plague being the worst. In chapters 13 through 14, Israel leaves Egypt with many riches, just as God promised. Um, However, as they travel through the wilderness, Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened. Again, and he violently pursues the people of Israel with hundreds of soldiers and chariots. You know, keep in mind the stage here. This is the mightiest nation probably in the history of the world, possibly the richest nation in the history of the world. 
God strategically sends Israel to, um, to what seems to be a dead end. They arrive at the Red Sea. Israel's afraid. Moses is confident. God tells Moses to raise his staff and parts the Red Sea. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites walk through the Red Sea as on dry ground. And I have, um, here's a map from the ESV Study Bible of that. So here's, you kind of have where it's kind of the traditional um, view of where they crossed up here. And you think, oh, that looks kind of small. But when you really look at it from Google Earth, I mean, you could see it from space and it's, um, it's pretty amazing, right? That, that, I mean, that's a huge body of water. Um, Okay. As the Egyptians pursue the Israelites, they are swallowed up in the water and killed. Every one of them, God delivers Israel from the Egyptians. Chapter 15, after this great deliverance, Moses and the people sing and worship. But not for long. Chapter 15 through 18 really highlight Israel's sin, but also at the same time God's faithfulness. Israel quickly forgets about God's amazing deliverances at the Red, deliverance at the Red Sea. Not soon after the amazing plagues and the, the Red Sea deliverance do they begin to murmur and complain. Israel doubts God's promises, His presence with them, and His ability to provide for them. God gives the vic- people victory in the first battle, and after Moses quickly realizes it, he, he can't govern these people all by himself. He listens to his father-in-law's advice and appoints elders to help govern the people. And then chapter 19, you have the people coming together at Mount Sinai to enter into covenant with Yahweh. Okay, that's just a little bit of the storyline. And I want to kind of slow it down a little bit and walk through some key theological points. Um, I want to talk about, first, God's motive. Why, Why did God choose to save Israel in that way? When you think about it, like, why didn't, why did God, you know, wait 400 and something years why did god let all the slavery happen you know why why was he why was it seemingly slow to fulfill his promise why you know why um you know scripture doesn't tell us every little single thing but i want to talk about some of the motives of why god chose to save israel in the way he did okay so we established that god had already promised in genesis to abraham 400 years abraham in 400 years, there will be a fulfillment of this promise, and I'll deliver your people, your children, out of the hands of a mighty nation and bring them to the promised land. And we talked about a little bit of the wisdom of that. God's people were able to be fruitful and multiply in the most pro- prosperous country of the time and possibly known to man. So it's a means of grace for some of the practicalities of that promise to be fulfilled. It gives them a few hundred years in a very prosperous land. You know, it wasn't towards the end where they became slaves. Um, God was able to work in Moses' life to prepare him for this work, right? So Moses wasn't ready immediately to be the, the lowercase s savior of Israel, right? You know, he grew up, you know, 40 years in Pharaoh's court, Right? And you would think, wow, learning all of the government structures and all this wisdom and all the literature and all of that stuff about the culture would be enough. No. He, God gives them to live out in the wilderness and in the tent life. What it's like to really live out in the wilderness right, for 40, for 40 years. You know, Moses had a strong sense of justice, I really believe. You, know, you have him seeing the, the um, oppression happen. And so he gets angry and takes matters into his own hands and kills an Egyptian. You know, then he goes to um, to Midian, and his first place in Midian, he helps these women who, you know, these these shepherds come and they're trying to get water and take over, and he sends them off, right? And it impresses a, 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 a you know a, a man and a man get hey here's my daughter marry her, you know, but God had to work in Moses, so he wasn't ready. He um, God was waiting. Also, we talked about this for the iniquity of the Amalekites to be complete, right? He, he, he makes it very clear that Israel wasn't going to enter the land because of their righteousness, but because of the wickedness of the Amalekites. Leviticus will get into some of the stuff that they are doing, but you see a lot of wicked things. And so they were, Israel was going to be um, bear the sword for God, essentially, upon the people. 
Okay, so God's justice and goodness was being worked out. Um, God chose a rich country so that Israel could leave with many riches. They left rich. And they used their riches to build the tabernacle. Some chapters 20 and on. Made of gold and fine linen and all of these wonderful things. You know, that stuff doesn't grow in the, on the trees in the, in the wilderness, I guess. Um, you know, God allowed Egypt to get mighty and prosper so that He could get maximum glory for when He delivered them and judged them. So there's also His providence in saying, I'm going to let Egypt, I'm going to raise them up just so I could bring them down. Okay? And there are other million things that perhaps happened and we won't know. Um, so those are some of the things that, that, that it's clear. Um, but what about God's ultimate motive? We, you know, there are, you know, I think it was John Piper who said, you know, God's always doing a million things. And we know maybe a couple. Okay? So I'm just talking about those couple of things. But what about God's ultimate motive in all of this? What could we say, is there an ultimate motive that, that God was operating on and why He did what He did? And we could say, yes. Let's talk about that. Um, so, chapter 5, Pharaoh says, Who is Yahweh that I should obey Him? And the next following chapters are Yahweh's, is Yahweh's answer to Pharaoh of who He is. Okay? Um, so God's motive in the salvation of Israel in Exodus. All right, chapter 7. This is where I'm going to just run through a lot of scriptures. What's that ultimate motive? Exodus 7, 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Exodus 8, 10. And he said, tomorrow, Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Exodus 8.22 But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell, so that no swarms of the flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Exodus 9.29 Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Exodus 12, 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Exodus 4, 4, 14, 4, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. So what was God's ultimate motive in the saving of Israel in this way? His glory. His glory being... Notice that, notice that this was not just... Um, a small sphere, you know, just that my glory may be known among, you know, a few people. This was a global thing so that, I, that the nations may know that I am the Lord. So this was God's glory demonstrated to the nations. Okay? So, and we've, so God's motive for everything He does, God's glory. Um, as established... You know, in our Genesis study, you know, we, we talked about the goodness of God in creation. You know, we talk and, and also God being glory and the God centeredness of creation. Um, we talked about um, how it's good for us that God is after his own glory, that that's a good thing for us. You know, it's a bad thing when you do everything for your own glory, it leads to death and, and it brings people away from you, right? But when God does everything for His glory, it brings life. And it can bring people together, it's church together, and a lot of wonderful things. Um, so it's a good thing that God does everything for His own glory. And I want to walk through, here's just a few ways, sorry I don't have this on the screen, but a few ways in Exodus um, that God's love for His own glory was for the good of the people. So here's just a list of a few things that the text reveals that were good things that happened for the people 
because God acted on behalf of His glory. So it caused Him to hear the groanings and the cries of His people. So because God was doing everything for His glory, it caused Him to hear Israel when they groaned and when they cried. It caused Him to remember His promises and to be faithful to the covenant He made with Abraham. It brought salvation to His covenant people from slavery. It brought Israelites to freedom so that they could come and worship God. Um, It gave Israel a prosperous land where God would dwell with them. And it brought destruction and judgment to the wicked, the Egyptians and the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. So because God moved on His glory, He was doing a lot of good things. He was hearing the groanings of His people. He was remembering His promises. He was saving His people. And He was judging the wicked. Those are all very good things. So God's glory is always for our greatest good. So in Exodus, we see the fact that, that God chose to we see that God chose to demonstrate his glory in the greatest way to the nations, the salvation of his people and the destruction of the wicked. So God's saying in Exodus, I want to get glory. The nations will know. You will know that I'm the Lord. And what is the ultimate act that he does to reflect that, to bring light to his glory? It's the redemption of his people and the salvation of the wicked. A very good thing. Um, And in fact, you know, again, thinking about typology for a moment. Remember we talked about typology being um, a, a person, place, thing, or event that foreshadows something in the old to point to something greater in the new. What the New Testament is going to take from this Exodus account and, and, and say it's a foreshadowing and a pointing to the redemption that is in Christ. Right? So this is just a minor thing. It, it's a big thing, but it's the lesser thing pointing to the greater thing to come. Um, so this motive of God's wanting to, to get glory out of the saving of his people and the judgment of the wicked is nothing new. It's nothing isolated to just Exodus. Exodus was meant to point to the ultimate motive of God's glory. Or we could say, what was the ultimate purpose for which God made the world? Why does history exist? What is the way, out of all things created in all time in history, that God gets the most glory? It's the redemption that is in Christ for his people. Um... So we'll see later that this salvation that God brought His people in Exodus Exodus, was simply meant to foreshadow a salvation to come that would be greater. This was just the shadow, but now the substance have come, the lesser to the greater. If God got this much glory for the shadow, how much more for the reality in which the shadow pointed? Um, So what gives God the most glory? in history, with everything that exists. Another way of asking, why did God create the world? Um, We'll see that the New Testament teaches us, and what Exodus foreshadows, that God created the world to exalt Himself in the salvation of sinners from every tribe and nation by His only Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Um, John Piper says, The ultimate purpose of creating and guiding and sustaining this world This history is the praise of the glory of the grace of God and the crucifixion of His Son for sinners. So this is how God designed, this is God's design of how He would receive maximum glory is by the death and resurrection of His Son for people from every tribe and the judgment of the wicked forever. So this was a wonderful foreshadowing of the ultimate deliverance that would come in Christ. Okay, moving on. Yahweh's superiority over Egypt's gods. So Exodus 6.12, we really see Yahweh, His superiority over the gods of Egypt. Why did God choose the plagues that He chose? Why? How would the Egyptians perceive what was going on? You know, Maybe we don't understand. We don't. We don't get it. But but the the Egyptians. There was a message that God was wanting to give to the Egyptians, and and they got it. What was that message? 
um, Exodus 12, 12 kind of gives us, um, gives us the answer to that. He says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the, I am the Lord. And then Numbers 30, 33, 4 says, While the Egyptians were burying all the firstborn whom the Lord had struck down among them, on their gods also the Lord executed judgments. So this plagues were strategic to be God's judgment upon their gods and showing His superiority over them and their lack of ability to save. So He was saying, you will know that I am the Lord and that there is no one like Me on the earth. Um, so Yahweh demonstrated His power over Egypt's false gods. This was the greatest nation in the world. And in this day, they would attribute all of their success because of their gods. Um, so at the time, one scholar says, gods were thought by ancient Near Easterners to possess no power except on their own home ground. He was going to demonstrate His power and that the whole, the whole earth was Yahweh's. So at one point, he says, I'm in Egypt. There's no God like me in Egypt. He's this foreign nation's God who's saying, no, Egypt's mine. So each plague was a direct attack on Egypt's false gods and demonstrated Yahweh's power over them. So we have a list, some of the plagues in Egypt's gods. Um, you have the river Nile turning to blood. You have the, that being a, a judgment on the Nile River god Hapi. Um, the, the frogs, the frog head goddess of Heket. The goddess, she was the goddess of the resurrection who assisted women at childbirth. The goddess of the resurrection can't save. Can't bring to life. The gnats. The fact that Aaron was to strike the dust of the earth is significant. This could have been an act of judgment on the god of the earth, Geb. He was the one who caused the crops to grow. You have the flies. This could have been an attack on the god of Uachit or Ra. The death of the livestock. There's a few other gods that it could be attributed to. The ashes and dust. Um, and boils. So the ashes and the dust, boils were brought from them, and it was the soot, soot made from a bricking where they went to make bricks. This was a symbol of Egypt's bondage on Israel and um, the very thing that they were using to bond, you know, force bondage on them, God used to bring a judgment upon them. Um, hail and fire, again, these are all judgments. I could list all the different um, pagan gods. Um, the locust, Nep Nepri, the god of grain. And then there was also the goddess of childbirth and crops, the goddess of fertility and harvest, and another god of the crops, right? So what we're just seeing on and on and on. The death of the firstborn. This would have, been, this would have really shown the inability of all the gods to save and protect. There wasn't anyone in Egypt who escaped this. Man nor beast, not even Pharaoh himself, who claimed to be a god. Um, so with that, let's talk about Yahweh's all superiority and power over Pharaoh. Keep in mind, this Pharaoh considered himself a deity. And this was also the most powerful nation in the world. The scriptures give us a little bit of enlightenment of, of, of what how God's superiority was, was demonstrated. It says, Pharaoh did not rise to the top by his own power. It was given to him by God. Exodus 9.16 Not only did God raise up Pharaoh, but He also raised him up for the purpose that Yahweh, not Pharaoh, would get worldwide glory. Exodus 9.16 Yahweh was the Lord over Pharaoh's heart and was able to harden it to accomplish His will. 7.3 not even Pharaoh or his household was able to escape Yahweh's judgments. Also, Yahweh destroyed the armies of Pharaoh without Israel even lifting a finger. So he couldn't even, people in Egypt couldn't even say, well, it was really just the army of Israel, not the God of Israel. No, Israel did not lift a finger to defeat the armies of Israel. It was all a miracle. Right, so nobody, you couldn't boast in chariots and horses and all of, you know. No, it was all God. Um, and also this gives us a demonstration, ultimately, 
Again, what's the, the shadow pointing to? Ultimately, of Yahweh's superiority and power over Satan. Colossians 1, um, 13-14 kind of talks about this foreshadowing. It says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us from the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this event was foreshadowed, the foreshadowing of when God, God's Christ would deliver His people from slavery of sin and crush the head of the serpent through His death and resurrection. God saves His people by the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ, in order to redeem His people from slavery unto Himself forever. You know, and it's pretty ironic. We talk about the ultimate exodus being the crushing of the serpent's head of Christ. Um, it is pretty ironic when you see what this is foreshadowing, and then when you look at ancient Egyptian um, you know, artifacts and stuff, I mean, the kings wore snakes around their head to represent their gods. Isn't that just pretty ironic? So I found some pictures. You know, um, there's uh, one, and then there was another garment they wore. Again, the snakes over the head. I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so we have in Exodus a picture of God's ultimate redemption of humanity from death and Satan into the kingdom of God through the precious blood of Jesus. So this was a foreshadowing of the fulfillment of the promise of Genesis 3.15. All right, so let's move on and talk about the Passover lamb. Oh, actually, um, it's very interesting. Again, this, what is this pointing to in Revelation chapter 15? It's a beautiful image where you have um, God bringing about the new heavens and the new earth. Um, you know, is the ultimate event that happens in Revelation. But you see this series of plagues that God brings on um, the nations, the wicked nations that don't repent. And they're very similar to the plagues He sent on, on Egypt. right? And God redeems His people through Jesus and it's sent, they're, they're singing with harps by God, given to them by God in Revelation 15. And it says that they sing the harps, the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Right? So God's people will sing just like um, the people of Israel sang in Exodus 15 when they came out of the, um, the Red Sea to be delivered. That was the song of Moses. Then it will be the song of the Lamb. So it's a very beautiful imagery that the New Testament kind of is moving towards. Um, Passover lamb to Exodus 12. So this section is actually very interesting and it's very important for obvious reasons of why we should understand this. You know, we talk about how is Jesus, how is the Old Testament about Jesus? You know, we, we mentioned he's promised and he's foreshadowed. You know, so this is a very important foundation that goes on into the new that's very, very obvious for us. But what's very interesting about this discussion is is that right when this before this event happen, happens, what God does is He then, the story takes a pause, and you start giving this, this, this description starts happening of how the Israelites are, should do the Passover feast. A ceremony is being built into it. So it's almost like reading the Passion, right? And you're getting ready, Jesus is getting ready to die, but the Gospel writer stops and starts talking about the Lord's Supper and how it's to be, you know, how it's to be done. Um, but that's kind of like what's happening here because this is a huge foundation um, in the story of redemption. Um, and God goes into great detail on how the Israelites are to conduct the Passover. He also stresses that He wants this event to be remembered every year in Israel's history. Very important. He says, here's this Passover lamb that is your salvation and from Egypt, you need to remember this every year. Every year. It was to be so monumental that God, is, that God says this is going to be the start of a new year on the calendar. So when Israel is getting sent out into their, the promised land, a new year had started on their calendar that marked the Passover. So important that it was to start out the year. And every year they would perform ceremonies. The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the consecration of the, the firstborn, so that Israel would not forget their salvation. And that they would use this as a way of remembrance of their salvation and also teaching moments for future generations. Um, 
I'll skip, I'll skip this part. You know, what, one thing that the Passover teaches us is that, you know, we could talk about the need for, for, um, to be, be, for God's people to be reminded and stuff regularly. And, that, you know, we won't linger there because we're running later on time. But um, it shows us that Israel was, was only saved, not because they were through substitution. Israel, you know, if you read, we'll get into the law and we'll see the same things that they're supposed to stone people over were what their fathers did. You know, so Israel is no greater than the nations, and they're only saved because of the Passover lamb. Very important. You know, the New Testament teaches us that Christ is the Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So Jesus is the lamb without blemish, whose blood is shed in our place. It's the only basis of Christ's blood that we are saved Jesus was actually crucified during the Passover celebration, and he inaugurated the Lord's Supper in place of the Old Testament Passover. None of his bones were broken like the Passover lamb. He was crucified the same day the Passover lambs were celebrated. I already mentioned that, mentioned that twice. Um, the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed so the firstborn child could live. Christ, the firstborn of God, was slain so that we could live. Um, Anyways, all right, so I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to have to speed up and skip stuff. So um, moving on really quick, you get to the Red Sea and the wilderness wanderings, Exodus um, 14 through 18. These are actually really sad, but before you pick up to throw a stone at them, you know, really this is, this is you as well. Sorry, I see myself so much in this. Um, so right after God miraculously delivers um, Israel, from all of these incredible plagues that he did, right? They were never touched. But then you have these Red Sea, that incredible experience of deliverance. God's people begin to fall into sin and to doubt. God provides for them. Okay, a couple days go by, and they start murmuring and complaining and doubting again. It's actually very sad. Um, what was their problem? What was their problem? Um trying to debate how much time. Okay, really quick. What was Israel's problem? Um, just because we've been talking about biblical counseling, I'm going I'm to talk about this. So Psalms 106 gives us kind of an insight into the problem of Israel. It's pretty wonderful. He says, um, Both we and our fathers have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. But they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his namesake, that he may, may, might make his, known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. And he led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe, and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries, and not one of them was left. Then, listen to this, they believed his words. They sang his praise. But soon they forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. He gave them what they asked. Okay. Um, so what you're seeing in, in this psalm, you're seeing, you know, they did not consider God's past works. They did not remember his past deliverances. They were forgetful. They forgot about God's love towards them. God's love was the motive of saving them. And when they actually did something right and praised God, it was because they believed His words. But soon after they believed God's words, they forgot again and didn't wait for His counsel. So what we're seeing is really what was Israel's problem? They did not consider and remember, and meditate. They were very forgetful. So again, like we talked about last week, forgetfulness is an enemy of faith. So Israel just got so caught up in their situation that they did not stop and remember, yeah, but three days ago, hundreds of thousands of us were actually walked on dry ground. They didn't stop. They did not meditate. They did not remember, right? And so it was their faithlessness was because of their forgetfulness, right? Um, and actually, it's, um, you know, I have up here Psalm 77. We won't have time to read it. Um, 
but um, I won't read the whole thing. But we see this. Um, you see, the Israel's problem on a on a corporate level was this. But you know, the Psalms really show us how to apply. You know, these big corporate events of God's salvation—they're not really meant to be just these big corporate events. You know, um, you turn to Psalm seventy-seven, and you see how how this man is really depressed and is groaning. And what does he do in order to be revived? Um, Psalm 77 says, I cried aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. How is he feeling there? He's so, I mean, this is some epic depression he's got going on. I mean, he's even trying to meditate and it's not working. Right? But what happens? What's the transition? I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. So there is a way of, I mean, this is just showing us that sometimes just this quoting a verse once or twice and, right, you know, we're not really raising our Ebenezer at that moment. You know, sometimes it doesn't help. So whatever type of meditation he was trying to do wasn't working. But then he says, but then my soul made a diligent search. What does he say? Will the Lord spurn forever? Has have he never again and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? That's Exodus earlier, Exodus thirty four. And in his anger shut up his compassion? Exodus thirty four. Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. Where does he go in his heart to meditate? I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? The judgment on the Egyptian gods. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The, sc- the clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. So essentially, what, what is he, what is he, where is he going? He's going to the Exodus. Was he there? No. This is hundreds of years later. But he's got an issue he's going, going, going on in his life. You know, he's, he's very distressed about. What does he do? He sits down, makes a diligent search, and he starts talking about who God is, and he and he's and he's reflecting on the character of God. And what we see is we see just a lot of the stuff going on in Exodus. He's quoting that verse in, in Exodus 34, right? That we talked about. We, he's 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 reviewing how God's great judgments on all the other gods that there's none like Him. And then he starts meditating on the Red Sea, right? So it would be the equivalent now of a depressed Christian worried about whatever now and. And he's saying, like, I'm really just depressed. God, where are you in my life? Hold on, soul. I'm going to make a diligent search. And it's open up those scriptures and meditating, pondering, and going to the cross, looking at the cross, looking at the cross, looking at the resurrection and the promises of God, and really just lingering there. You know, and what we see, he is doing what Israel did not do. Right, and so he's fighting for joy going to this corporate event like the Red Sea. And he's applying it to himself and who God is. And he's lingering there. And what does it do? It revives him. So that's how faith, and again, going back to knowing God, using the word to to know God, right? Um, Sometimes just some flippant, you know, quoting a fighter verse isn't enough in the moment. Sometimes you got to do a, whatever a diligent search means, you got to do a diligent search. Um, um, so just in closing, what is God doing? God is in the process of fulfilling His promise to Adam and Eve, the promise to restore the kingdom, His kingdom on earth. He is setting apart 
the people of Israel unto himself to be the instrument of blessing he uses to bring the Savior of the world to the nations, Jesus Christ. Amen. Any questions? Mm. Sure. Trying to think if I completely understand. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, so, you know, I think about the whole circumcision and this stuff, you know, think, remember, this is a stage in redemptive history. So this is a certain point in time where he, at a certain po- point in time, entered into a, a certain covenant in a certain point of time, right? Um, so from the very beginning, God's people were those who expressed faith in God, right? So, um, and then we'll, we'll really see if we could fast forward to the end of history, you know, who are the people of God? You know, you see it all being under the head of Christ. So you have all of the believing saints from Adam, right, to, you know, the end of the whole Old Testament history, I guess you would say John the Baptist, to the church age on, on. So all becoming under that federal head of Christ. Um, and so you have people in different Stages. So let's say the pre-Abrahamic covenant where they, they were not circumcised, yet they had saving faith in God. And so in that stage of history, they were the believing people of God. Um, so then you have in this stage of history, you have, um, for instance, you have Gentiles coming in. So they even say, so there's even scripture just talking about how, how there was even some among the Egyptians and those around, a small remnant even came with Israel. Right? And so... But at this point in redemptive history, they entered into God's terms of being his people in that time. So they would have been, had, to get, had to get circumcised and all of that stuff because it was that, that part of redemptive history. Um, but being just an Israelite and circumcised did not mean that you were, just to use our terminology, saved. You know, they had to be circumcised at the heart. Because what we'll see when we get into Deuteronomy, that God gave his law... But the problem with the law was that it did not create a heart that was able to obey it, right? So their problem was their heart. Um, Now there was, you know, Moses says, circumcise your heart, circumcise your heart, you know, um, and really what we see is only really a remnant of people had circumcised heart. So if we think of like Old Testament equivalent of regeneration, we would use the terms maybe um, circumcised heart. So even only a remnant of Israel had a circumcised heart. Because what we even see here, you know, what is how does God rebuke Israel even at this point in history? They were not believing God, right? They had all these external stuff, but there was no faith. And then later on in history, they're doing all of this, the sacrifices and all that stuff, but there's no faith, and, and the prophets come and rebuke them of their hypocrisy, right? So this is kind of even stuff I'm getting into next week where I'm really trying to get in, like, what was the nature of the Old Testament law, the Mosaic Covenant? Was it... Was it works? Was it legalism? Was it, you know, so hopefully, I don't know, maybe, it, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, um, so there, God does preserve a remnant, and there are remnant believers in Israel, now, but for the most part, Israel's unbelieving, and that's why you have God promising a, the Israel coming, who would be God's servant, who would obey, and it being Jesus. And um, so he's the son. Israel's called in this point of redemption history, Israel, my son, right? Um, they fail, and then Christ comes, you know, the Son of God, the true Israel, and obeys. All God's people from both covenants are in Christ and um, saved in the people of God forever. Anyway, yeah, great question. If I didn't explain it 
we or answer your question. Okay. Any other questions? Um, other than bondage and mm-hmm. sure yeah definitely I think uh, you know with, with with types I think a safe place to start is just to 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 say no more than what the New Testament says you know is a safe place to start and I think it does say all of that you know um, you you have even Old Testament in the I'll have to look it up, but you'll have later on where he promises um, when this return from exile happens that he's going to have his people even from Egypt, you know, and the surrounding nations. So, so there's definitely even salvation in that nation to come, which is pretty wonderful. All right, let's, all right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, is. The, pro- the proverb that um, John Mark quoted earlier, that we would listen to your voice and heed it and keep it before us and not forget it. Lord, help us to know you and to love you and to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.